bless his heart, the Pope is in trouble again. Oh, that boy, he just keeps talking. You see, here's the thing. <laughs> the Pope is an exceedingly wise and gracious man. If Methodists had a Pope, I think I would choose Pope Francis because he's a good guy. Well, here's what he said that got him in trouble. By the way, I'll, we'll get to the scripture in just a moment. He made a comment recently that has got him in hot water. First, during an interreligious meeting of Catholic Junior College in Singapore, he said that religions are like different languages in order to arrive at God. The different world religions are different languages in order to arrive at God. Now, you do recognize this is fairly wild stuff coming from the Pope. But God is God for all meaning whether you're Catholic or Protestant or whatever you are. Carol, good morning. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't see anybody till I come down here. It's so good, it's so good to have you back. Um, but God is God for all, and if God is God for all, then we are all sons and daughters of God. And he's saying that, all people of all faiths have a chance to go to heaven and some other conservative Catholics. Now, by the way, I'm critical of that word. Now, if you think of yourself conservative, I may not be critical of your conservatism, but the word conservative generally means today that there are groups of people that you want to leave out, not only of our love, but God's love. Uh, they may be minorities of all kinds that you want to leave out. Uh, certain churches want to leave out everybody else in every other church. And uh, <laughs> Catholics have, uh, uh, conservative Catholics around the world have gotten upset with the Pope for saying that. But the Pope is, is, is he's a loving person. He knows that <laughs> he know he knows that all of the people in the world are not going to hell except Catholics. Anyone who knows Jesus Christ ought to be able to figure that out. Uh, and he, and <laughs> There are other people even who, uh, who believe in Jesus Christ other than just Catholics. But he's also including folks who may not be believers in Jesus Christ. Well, listen, I think that one thing that the church has gotten wrong through the ages, and that's what we're talking about today, what the church has gotten wrong about salvation, is the church has gotten salvation wrong in two ways. And the first way is the understanding that only Christians are going to get to go to heaven. When you asked our blessed Lord about salvation, and someone did, by the way, someone asked him once, what must I do to be saved? And he laid down two standards. And you know what those standards are. And this was someone actually who was trying to test him. And this proceeds in scripture in Luke, the story of the Good Samaritan. The guy said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you know, you know already what you must do to be saved. And he said, what is that? And the guy said, well, and he used the lines right back that Jesus always used with people when he talked about it. He said, you have to do this, the guy said. You have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. Okay. And he said, the second thing you have to do is you have to love your neighbor as you love yourself. All right. Now, this is Jesus' understanding of what you must do to be saved. But some people will say, after our Lord's death, 
the rules changed. No, they didn't. Jesus didn't say, well, while I am here with you, these are the rules. But when I go to the cross, the rules are all going to change. And then there's going to be only one requirement, and it has nothing to do with love. That requirement is that you believe in me. He never said that. Now, I'm going to tell you before this sermon is over, I hope, why it is extraordinarily important and wise and right that we believe in Jesus Christ and why I would not actually myself choose any other religious faith, although some of them have many appealing aspects and all of them capture some of the truth of God. Now, I'll be telling you that at the end of the sermon. But right now I'm telling you that the rules didn't change just because our blessed Lord went to the cross. That was a part of his presentation to us of the nature of God. The fact that our sins are forgiven because God takes our sins upon himself. But as far as what you do to be saved, he said there are two things. You love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And when Jesus himself used these words rather than the questioner, he said, and the second one is just like it. The second thing you do is just like that first one. He said, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, one thing that we are discovering, that we have discovered in my sister's class on near-death experience is that there are a lot of people who get into heaven who are not Methodists. Can you believe it? And they're not Baptists. And they're not Catholics. <laughs> Some of them are members of other religions. And some end up there who didn't believe much of nothing while they were here, but they end up there. <laughs> Why? Because it's all a question of love. And because God is, is not looking for some trick in the book, some last minute tricky question to keep people out. Because it is God's will <laughs> that the whole world be saved. And if that is God's will, by the way, if it is God's will that the whole world be saved, eventually I'm telling you, I'm not denying hell. We're going to we're going to take a little trip through hell in just a minute. I'm not denying hell, but I am telling you that it is God's will that everyone be saved. And here's number two. If something is God's will, it will be done. Well, let, let me share a story with you. This is about a 17-year-old kid, 17 years old. He was, just, he was just a kid, just a 17-year-old dude, he calls himself. And by the way, those of you who have been in the class, you're going to recognize this story. But it, it affected me so much that I want to preach about today. And he was driving at the age of 17 uh, at 140 miles an hour. I think I met him yesterday. He passed me on the freeway. And he lost control of the car, and the car hit a tree sideways. And he was all mangled up in the mess of the metal. <laughs> and... They took him in an ambulance to the hospital, and for 10 long minutes, the boy's heart was not beating. He was dead. Here's what he says. I better change my paper. I'll be reading to you what the Pope said. Here it is. As soon as the car hit the pole, I saw nothing immediately. I presumed I was dead. Now, that's interesting because a lot of people, when this happens from near-death experiences, don't know immediately that they're dead, and they don't quite know what's happening to them. I presumed I was dead, but soon realized that I was still conscious, and this shouldn't be. I couldn't see. I couldn't smell. I couldn't feel anything. And it was as if I were paralyzed, but I was still standing up at the same time. And about this time, I started thinking to myself, well, this, excuse my language, 
This sucked. I think that's the first time I've ever said that in a sermon, and I may not should have then. And I also thought, well, I was right. I knew all along there would, uh, that I would end up, that there would end up being no God or afterlife, and that religion was all nonsense. At that very moment, I thought this, the most terrifying experience of my life occurred. Quietly at first, I began hearing non-worldly voices of evil and laughter. I became scared and didn't know what was going on. The voices got louder and louder, and soon I could feel the presence of beings of evil all around me. The voices began to become more distinctive, and some of the beings were shouting, hey, come with us, come with us, ha ha. Are you ready for it? It was very scary. I began to realize that it sounded as though those were demons or something like that, even though before the experience, I was very critical of religion and God, even at 17, which is interesting. These things were convincing me otherwise, and I immediately began to say, say to them, hey, Jesus loves me. The power of God will kill all of you. Jesus, save me. Well, the beings started to yell. They were furious. There is no blanking God, pathetic, ugly you. If there was a God, your life would have been worth more than blank. And so I continued, Jesus, save me. I believe in you, Jesus. God, help me. And the demons continued to yell and curse at me. But at the same time, they were slowly retracting from me and their presence was minimizing. Now, I think we need to understand that these demons are really folks that are basically like you and me who have done the one thing that you do that will put you in this situation, which will say to God, I don't want you. And God has given us freedom to say that. I want to have nothing to do with you. I don't want you. I don't, if you, I don't want your love. I don't want nothing to do with you. And if you're determined in that, then something like this could be in one's future. But notice all it takes to get out of here. All right? Notice all it takes. At this moment, a piercing white beam of light shot down to us. The demons began screaming and moaning as if they were melting, and soon they simply disappeared. The light was literally blinding, but I could stare directly into it without flinching. I felt as though I all of a sudden knew everything there was to know about everything, and I felt this enormous presence of love and respect and everything good. Artistic portrayals of Jesus begin flashing before my eyes. Now, I want you to notice this. In so many of these experiences, the person at the heart of that experience is Jesus Christ. We read another in which a Hindu man who was not a very nice guy had a bad experience, but then the light broke through. And he said he felt that the light was probably Jesus. Next week in my sister's class, she's going to look at one in which a Jewish, young Jewish woman was knocked off a horse at the age 16, hit her head, was in bad shape. She had an extraordinary experience. And guess who she saw? She saw Jesus. What this tells me is Jesus is a reality, all right? Artistic portrayals of Jesus begin flashing before my eyes. All different kinds of pictures and paintings. And I saw a sequence of the crucifixion of Christ. 
In other words, God chose to present to this young man a series of images of the crucifixion of our Lord. Why did he do that? Because the crucifixion is what, is what we have always believed it to be. It's at the heart of our relationship to God. It's an image of our forgiveness for God. Images of the crucifixion. The light was getting brighter and this time wider. Soon Jesus appeared in front of me and I could do nothing but fall to my knees and then lay my head on the floor at his feet. It was like that for an eternity. Well, the boy was out of it for only 10 minutes. Why an eternity? Because there is no time. Okay? So he felt, he felt it was ages that he was there kneeling before God. When, of course, in earthly time, it was only a minute or so. And Jesus said, and listen to these words, You are worthy, child. Rise. You are worthy. Why is he worthy? Had he lived his life for Jesus Christ in this world? No, he had not. Had he told people about God's love through Jesus Christ? No, he had not. Why did our Lord himself tell him, you are worthy? Because God loved him and God bore already every sin that he had committed in his life. And he said to him, you are worthy. Rise. So I did. And I faced the Lord Jesus Christ with utmost guilt and feeling of other, utter insignificance. And Jesus said, well, you have learned from your mistakes, my child. You will return. And this is what people are often told. And you will show others the way. You will spread the love of God. Now, it sounds like our Lord himself talking, doesn't it? Sounds just like it. If that's this boy's calling in the world, isn't that your calling and isn't that my calling? I immediately began to weep uncontrollably, yes, even as a 17-year-old boy. And I kept saying, I, I am unworthy, Lord. And at this moment, I was in the presence of suddenly all of my deceased relatives who had passed on. There were two uncles, an aunt, a grandfather, and a great-grandmother of um, whom uh, none, and none of them spoke, but all of them pointed to the ground, indicating, I must return. I was immediately in my mortal body back in that hospital room looking at my parents and friends and thinking, would they ever believe the story I have to tell. Now we've just looked at, um, talked about a Hindu guy and uh, a Jewish young girl and a 17 year old kid who was uh, confirmably convinced that God, and we've always believed, of course, I, re I remember, I remember a sermon by, um, who is the guy? Who is the guy? This is what you call a senior moment. It wasn't Jerry Falwell. It was the guy down in Louisiana who is the brother of a... Who? Swagger. Swagger. Swag, Jimmy Swagger. Okay. Jimmy, I remember a sermon of Jimmy Swagger. And there was a young man who had ridden up to the church on a bicycle. And Jimmy Swagger said, we offered the invitation. And I was looking at that young man dressed like a hippie sitting back there. And I, I knew he had never given his heart to the Lord. And I waited during that invitation for that young man to come forward. And we were singing, why not tonight? Why not tonight? And he said that young man did not move. And when he got up from that service, he went out the door lost and not far from the church that morning as he was speeding along on that motorbike he lost control and he died and that young man he said 
will be spending eternity in hell. And Jimmy Swaggart sounded like he knew. Because we think that there's a cutoff date that God has it fixed. So, well, I'll give you this, this amount of time. And if you get beyond this amount of time, you, you, you are done. Your goose is cooked, literally, for eternity. What did our Lord tell Peter about forgiveness? How many times do you forgive? Did Peter said, do you do it seven times? Jesus said, no, seven times seven, meaning an infinite number of times. <laughs> There's a scripture in Peter that says the moment Jesus died, he went first to hell and proclaimed the gospel to those who were there. And that proclamation is still going on in hell. But if there's anybody there today, and there probably are, they're just not listening. They're not listening. Someone who had a near-death experience said he had an image of hell. He was given kind of a tour of heaven. A guy named George Ritchie, a devout Christian who had a lot to do with the uh, uh, development of understanding of near-death experiences. Uh, Raymond Moody was one of his students in college, and he got interested in near-death experiences, and Raymond Moody is the guy who gave it the name. And, and George Ritchie said in the image that he saw of hell, there were all of these people there who were fighting one another. They couldn't do each other any harm, but they kept, still kept trying. That's what hell is. It's people who are still living, living then the way they lived on earth, and their, their interest in life is in hurting the next person, hurting the neighbor, okay? But he said, I noticed something else at first that I didn't even notice in this vision that God was showing me. He said, arching over heaven, there was a bright light, and I finally figured out it was these angels of such great size and brightness that I didn't recognize them theft. And they were watching over all of those people who were in hell and ministering to them. God's ministry goes on in every place in this world. But, you know, I do agree with Jimmy Swaggart on one thing. There's no use in wasting our time in this world. This is why our blessed Lord used to indicate there is an urgency about living for him, about deciding for him, an urgency. Because the moment we say to God, I'm going to let you love me, we begin to feel that love in our lives. And who wants to live without that? Yes, people from other faiths, of course, God loves them. They are God's children, and they can go to heaven. Of course they can. People who live this world, and I have dear friends who say that God does not exist. Do I think they're going to hell? If they do, it's only for about 10 minutes. Okay? Because they are people who know how to love. He said that, that second commandment was just like the first one. All right? Yes, that's true. Are all religions in the world equal then and I'm going to tell you as a minister of the gospel no no that's why I'm a Christian because the truth is that I believe the Christian faith is more correct about the nature of God than any other faith that I am familiar with. And no, I'm, I'm not denying the meaning in other faiths. And if there's anybody of some other faith listening to this, I'm, I'm not diminishing your faith or, or God's love for you. But the God that we meet in experience, any kind of experience, is a God of unconditional love, unconditional there is nothing that will turn God's love off. On our meanest day, God loves us just as much as on our best day. He loves the most evil person in this world the same as he loves you and me. Unconditional love, a God of unconditional love, a personal God who watches over us and loves us, whose eye is on the sparrow. And this is the God we meet in the teachings of Jesus Christ. I know of no one else anywhere in the world before our Lord 
in all the ancient literature who said that we are to love our enemy because God loves his enemy. We are to love those who do not love us because God loves those who do not love us. And I am a Christian because I believe the gospel is the highest truth that you can attain to. So that this guy who was a Hindu in a near-death experience saw a man dressed in a white robe with brown hair. He had blue eyes. And the Hindu said to the guy, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, your Savior. I'm looking at my watch, and what that tells you is I want to tell another story. There was a guy named uh, Sindhu, Sindhu Sindar Singe. <laughs> Obviously, he wasn't from Texas originally. And one of those is a, an honorary name for holy man. And he was a Sikh. He was Indian, from India. And he was a Sikh. And he was unhappy with his faith. And he was confused, and he was desperate to know the truth. He finally said to God, God, if you do not, do not show me the right way, I am going to kill myself. Well, I don't think that speeds God up any, but it did tell us that that the boy was serious. There's only one thing the young man knew. He knew he did not want Christianity. <laughs> he and his father, in fact, a few days before, had spent their full day burning every Bible they could get their hands on. He did not want Christianity. He knew that. So he prayed that prayer, and he went to bed that night. <laughs> And the next morning, after he had gotten up and taken a cold shower, he looked over in the corner of his room, and there was a white light. And it was forming into a figure. And the figure it formed into was Jesus Christ. He said, oh, no. He said, if it had been a Hindu god, he would have bowed immediately before it. But this was the Lord Jesus Christ, the very thing he did not want. He said to him, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus. And he said the same thing he said to Paul. How long will you persecute me? And then he fell to the floor and worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. These are not wild stories. They're not strange stories. The disciples after the resurrection, who did they see? The one who had died because he wasn't dead. And when that one, who wasn't dead then, isn't dead now. And all of us are going to see him and meet him. The Apostle Paul tells us that the time will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But you and I need to confess it every time when we get up in the morning because we'll have a lot better day. Because we'll know that the one who loves us is with us. And he is with us now as he promised. And however you may feel about your life right now, what God feels about you is that you are precious to him. And here's the point of this sermon. So is every other single person in this world. 
How does it change things for people? To look at people who are different from them and say, well, this also is a child of God. How does it change us to look at someone who's just come across that border in the South and look at that immigrant and say, this also is a child of God? What does it do if we look at those Haitians in Springfield, Ohio, and we say, each of them is also a child of God? This is the truth in Jesus Christ. Everyone belongs to God, and God through Jesus Christ, has given his life for everyone, and every soul is precious to him. And God is determined not to lose anything that belongs to him. Our understanding of salvation needs to be broadened to include people of other faiths, and our understanding of Jesus Christ needs to be broadened to understand that he is Lord of every life. The Bible tells us there's only one way to salvation. That's through Jesus Christ, and that's true. Now, if there were people of other faiths here today, I, I, I might just say it more softly. But all people are saved through Jesus Christ. Join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, make us loving to every neighbor, every neighbor, for all belong to you. And remind us, Lord, that whether we live or whether we die, we are yours also. In Jesus' name, we pray.